Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 17. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 17. As we're continuing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry, Jesus Christ has been making His way from His headquarters in Galilee, Capernaum, and He is making His final trek to the city of Jerusalem. When he gets to Jerusalem, he is going to be arrested, put on an illegal false trial. He is going to be scourged, beaten, crucified. He is going to be buried in a borrowed tomb. And the third day, he's going to rise again. But Jesus knows he is heading in that direction. He knows what he's going to face. And he's been trying to warn them. And he's giving some last minute instructions in this last journey to Jerusalem. Now he's been dealing with the Pharisees who have been popping up over and over to try to hinder the work and try to hinder uh, <coughs> what is going on. And Jesus has been turning to the disciples and teaching them, addressing the Pharisees, turning to the disciples. And this has been a continual action. And now finally Jesus finishes up that conversation and he moves on. And a very interesting event occurs in the gospel record of Luke chapter number 17. The gospel record of Luke chapter 17, and let's pick it up in verse number 11. The gospel record of Luke chapter 17 and verse number 11. Notice what the Bible says. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the Gospel record of Luke chapter 17? The Gospel record of Luke chapter number 17. And if you don't mind, in the verse number 16, notice the phrase, giving him thanks. Giving him thanks. And with the Lord's help, maybe we could rearrange our title just a tad bit. And said, he remembered to say thank you. He remembered to say thank you. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a God who loves us, who cares for us. I thank you for the Bible that we could read about your life and we can learn about the lessons that you want to teach us. I thank you for your spirit that we could trust to teach us and illuminate. Open our eyes. Give us understanding about these passages. Help us even now to see a God who's worth praising, worth glorifying. And that we would be a thankful people. Please fill me with your spirit and get your own work accomplished through your word in Jesus name. Amen. In the gospel record of Luke, chapter number 17, Jesus Christ is heading to Jerusalem and he's getting closer and closer. And there is a lot of things going on. In fact, in between verses uh, 10 and 11 is a tad bit of time and a story that is included in a different gospel record that is not included here. 
you might remember the story that Jesus went to the town of Bethany. And he went to his favorite stopping place of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And he had been received word that Lazarus had, de- had died. You remember that story? And Jesus went to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus went forth, still wearing his grave clothes and came out. Imagine what a miracle that would be. Now, do you think people were quiet about that story? Not at all. You understand that Jesus' fame is starting to get around. And that people have been telling about what Jesus is doing. So much so that some lepers in a leper colony had heard. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn to storytelling mode. I'll get to preaching in just a second. But, you know, sometimes with these stories, it'd be good to use our divine imagination. And be able to put a human voice, a human face, a human situation upon here. The Bible says that the man who came back, he was a Samaritan. A Samaritan is not a Jewish person. They come from the northern territory. The Jewish people hate them and despise them. They consider them half-breeds. But here is a Samaritan who is a human being. And he had a family, at least a mother and father. Maybe he was married. Maybe he had kids. But one day he saw that there was a small little white blemish on his skin. Maybe it was on his arm and maybe he would look at it for a couple days and think that this discoloration would go away. Maybe it would be all right. And when it wouldn't go away, he had to go to the doctor. Now today we have a horrible diagnosis that usually rocks people's world of cancer. Back in the ancient world, they had their own thing, leprosy. And so the doctor examined him and looked at him and said, Sir, I've got to tell you some bad news. You've contracted a disease called leprosy. Now, leprosy was a very awful disease in the ancient world. It wasn't something that would kill you as much as it would deteriorate your flesh. What would happen is leprosy would attack. It would start attacking your skin. You would start off with blemishes on your skin. Eventually, what would happen is that boils would form and then they would burst. And pus would begin to leak out. And they would continue to leak out. That many times you would have to wrap up that area that was infected, that was, that was leaking pus. And what would happen is that that pus would start soaking into the rag. And so the rag would be hardened and you'd have to constantly change as long as you had bandages. And those, the pus and the open up would would allow more infections to get into it. People, when they were worried in the ancient world, they didn't know about germs and whatnot. But it was very easy to pass other infections on you because of the leprosy that you had. So because of that, whenever someone was diagnosed with leprosy, Immediately, they lost their home. They could not live in the community. They had to live outside of the walls of the gate. In fact, the ancient world, they had certain rules that you had at least be six feet away from someone else. We understand that six foot rule. And if you were uh, in different communities, you had to be at least 150 feet away. When someone would approach you, you would have to announce yourself, I'm clean! I'm clean! And you'd have to cover your mouth so that way even your spittle couldn't go out and infect them. I'm clean! I'm clean! To let them know that you were infected and that they couldn't be around you at all and that they needed to make sure they stayed away. And in this type of life, Because he now had to say goodbye to his family. He couldn't stay and infect them. If they were not diagnosed with anything. In order to protect them. He had to go away. And so leper colonies would form. Where other lepers would find other lepers. And just kind of give a support system. But because they could not have a job. Because they could not work. they uh, They were isolated. They were alone. And depended on the gratitude and compassion of strangers. Just to even give them food. So imagine a man who gets a diagnosis and now because he loves his family he has to be quarantined, had to be isolated and have to say goodbye to his family, goodbye to his wife, goodbye to his kids. And I have to go live out here and I may never get cured. There may never be a disease. And if you ever see me, we always have to be a distance apart. And of course, this story becomes even more personable when we realize that there have been people who have been isolated for two or three years now. We understand the effects it happens on the mind. It starts to affect the mind quite a bit when you're alone. 
and don't have other personal contact. And the only contact that you have is from people far off. And so we could relate with him. He now has to build a home. Oftentimes lepers would live in caves. They couldn't live in another house because that house would be, end up being condemned. And so he would have to stay in some caves, maybe some other friends. And in the story it says that he is a Samaritan. The other are Jewish people. Now remember, typically Jewish people did not get along with Samaritans. But because it was the closest leper colony, he has to live with these Jewish people. And so not only are they infected, they probably isolate it from him because he's not one of them. He's a half-breed who happens to be in our place. So here's a man who is isolated, alone, diseased, affected, thinking that the rest of his life, that's how he's going to have to live. This horrible existence alone, never being able to go see his kids, no be able, never being able to hug his wife, missing all of this growing up, and any time they saw them that was afar off, depending on strangers because he couldn't have a job, isolated, alone, and even among the other sick people, he's alone. Then stories begin to be told that there's a prophet by the name of Jesus and that Jesus previously has already healed a leper. So that picks your ears up. Man, there's someone who could cure your leprosy. Oh, I want to see that guy. And then a story starts coming that this prophet has just recently raised someone from the dead. Oh, can you imagine? I want to meet a prophet like that. Oh, if I could just see someone like that. Then the news comes by. Jesus is coming this way tomorrow. Jesus is coming tomorrow, this prophet. Now, if you could allow me to tell a story and embellish that we can make it relatable. We don't know the details of this. It doesn't say anywhere. But I like putting a story with it. It makes it more personable, more relatable. So here's a man who's isolated and alone. And the other lepers begin to talk among themselves. And he overhears and says, what are you guys talking about? Hey, there's this Jewish prophet. He hears, he's coming this way. We, we told you about he healed a leper. We told you that he just raised the dead. He's coming this way. Maybe, maybe we could get his attention. How can we get his attention? We're lepers. We can't get close. I don't know. But let's go and let's meet at the side of the street. And we're going to wait for him. And when he comes, we'll, we'll, we'll try to holler. We'll try to get his attention. Are you in with this? Absolutely. Now, putting the human flavor and knowing how we'd be. Most of you, probably this man would start to think about, is this true? Dare I dare hope that tomorrow he could heal me? What would it be like I get to see my family again? What would it be like to get a reunion to be able to, to hug my kids again? To be able, oh, and his mind begins to race. And again, playing the human element, we don't know. But you think maybe he had a hard time going to sleep that night? Thinking about the possibilities. And then having the other side of him say, no, it's not true. You're probably going to miss him. It's, you know, why would he deal with you? And that hope and not hope and belief and unbelief. And again, in my mind's eye, I could see the man finally drifting off to sleep late, late night. And in the morning, waking up and already seeing it's dawn. Oh no, did I miss him? Hurrying up and trying to find your clothes and get things going up there. Now you're running late. Oh no. What if I missed him? What if he already passed? And oh, there. Could you see that happening? Could you see yourself in your shoes there trying to. Oh no. I just. It's... Finally that big day. Pit in your stomach. And you see a crowd start coming. A large crowd coming. Let's go back to the story and pick it back up. In the gospel record of Luke chapter number 17. Verse number 11. And it came to pass as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which were which stood afar off, as they should. They're far off. They're trying to obey the rules. And they see him. Hey, Jesus! 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 Notice what they say, verse 12, or verse 13. And they lifted up their voices and said to Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
Now, this is big. He doesn't, they don't just say teacher. They say master, ruler of everything, the maker. Jesus, have mercy on us. This is a phrase that an inferior would make to someone who is higher of rank. Have mercy on us. You have the ability to show mercy. You have the ability to control my fate. You have the ability to decide what's going to happen to me. Have mercy on us. Have mercy. You can imagine the rest of the crowds telling him to be quiet. Stay away. Cover your mouth. We don't want to hear. Jesus, have mercy on us. Please help us. Jesus. Now notice what happens. Verse number 14. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. Now notice, he didn't heal them. He said, Go show themselves to the priest. Why? Because according to the book of Leviticus, that when someone was healed of leprosy, before they could go back to society, they had to have a priest examine them and declare them to be clean. And so Jesus says, Go obey the law. Go to the priest. Now, they look down and they, they haven't been healed. But Jesus is giving them a command. Now, we can learn quite a bit from this story. Do you notice that Jesus is able to heal from afar? Yeah. He didn't have to touch them or slap them on the forehead or do anything like that. Jesus didn't have to do any theatrics. He didn't have to do any big play or big thing. Just go show yourself to the priest. Go. But notice... It was up to them to obey. These people were not healed until they obeyed the command of the master. The master said, go show yourself to the priest. Notice what happened. Verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. We learn another principle here. That if you are expecting God to answer prayer to heal, there's an expectation for you to obey what God has given you to do. That's a major step. There's so many times that Bible talks about obey first and then understanding will come. Obey first and then God will do his part. That there is an expectation that it's not just God do something for me as a genie in the bottle, as a Santa Claus in the sky. But Lord... I'll obey and God will do his part. And so they they're, have bruises. They have pus going down. They have open sores. They turn to go to the temple and immediately they're healed. Could you imagine what a feeling that would be to feel yourself healed? They turn. Maybe some of them were walking on canes. All of a sudden, those canes are laying on the ground as they're taking off running. Woohoo! I'm healed! This is wonderful! They can't wait to prove that they are clean. And they take off. They turn and they're healed. And they start running. Except for one. Notice them, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. So, 10 of them start taking off. They feel healed. Nine of them take off and start running. One of them stops in mid-step. Realizes he's healed. And he comes back to Jesus. Now, remember, before he was standing afar off. This time, he goes straight to Jesus. And he falls down at his face. And gives thanks. Now, as he's going back, he's glorifying God. Look at what God did. Look at what God did. This is amazing. Falls down at Jesus' face, or falls down at Jesus' feet, falls on his face, and says, Thank you, God. Thank you. And the Bible gives that description that he was a Samaritan. So Jesus, in the midst of the crowd, Jesus answering, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Now the nine are technically obeying God. Jesus said, go show yourself. And they are cleansed. They're healed physically. And they're going off. They're going to resume their new life. They got to see a miracle of God. And out of the ten, only one of them thought it appropriate to take time 
to thank God. The other ones were hurrying up because they wanted to get cleansed and resume their life. This one could have went that way, but he said, it's more important that I stop and thank God for this before I resume my life. Before I resume what I'm supposed to do. And Jesus is looking and says, hey, where's the nine? Everyone just sold ten of a fear, right? Only one. Now Jesus is giving this to the crowd as well. Verse 18. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Now this word stranger again is an indication that he's not Jewish. He was healed of God. And it was the one who was not God's people who was thankful. The rest of them took off. You know, it's interesting that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans, but every time Jesus deals with the Samaritans, he always uses them as a good example. He uses them to teach lessons to the Jewish people. And again, he's pointing out, this is a stranger. He's not even Hebrew. And he has enough sense to stop and thank God. Notice what Jesus said to him. Verse 19, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith had made thee whole. Those other nine, they're cleansed physically. This man is made whole. Meaning that because of his faith, because he trusted God's promises, he was also saved of his sins. He's in heaven. It wasn't just a healing here on earth. He was now made completely whole. And it was because of this thankfulness. Do you understand that God, Jesus here, just tied in two things together. Thankfulness and faith. Thankfulness and faith. You understand that this correlation is a big correlation that the Bible talks about it in more detail. This correlation between thankfulness and faith. If you don't mind, as we have the story now, let's hit the doctrine. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. And let's see what this, what we learn here. Maybe perhaps for this point of this idea here, we could say the dangers of not being thankful. The dangers of not being thankful. Thankful. We see in the book of Romans chapter number 1. The degression of people who have chosen not to follow after Christ. The degression of those who have rejected the picture of who God is. Notice if you don't mind. <laughs> let's hit the principle here. We're not going to hit this whole passage. But I'm going to highlight some things. Dealing with the idea of faith and thankfulness. Notice with me in verse number 17. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now remember the book of Romans chapter 1 where you start off with a declarative statement. The just shall live by faith. And the rest of the book of Romans chapter 1 here is going to deal with the idea of those who rejected that faith. Now, when we talk about rejecting the faith, we now see this idea of getting further away from God. Now, faith is when we're trusting in God. We're depending upon Him. And if we're truly trusting in Him, we should be thankful for His provision. That There's an idea that if we're truly trusting in Him, we should also be thankful for Him. For example, if God, you pray for something and God supplies something you need, a normal response is for you to thank God for it. That's part of that faith. We trusted God. When God came through, we're thankful. In fact, you could even apply it that you could thank God for a prayer request that hasn't been answered yet because you believe He is going to do it. There is a correlation between faith and thankfulness. So notice with me as we continue on in verse 21. 21 begins this slide away from God. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And if you haven't underlined this next three words, please do that. Neither were thankful. Do you know that the very first step of backsliding, the very first step of stepping away from God is not being thankful. 
It is such a small step, but it is a huge step in the area of faith. That the very first step of getting away from God, the very first step of backsliding, the very first step of going away from the Lord is unthankfulness. Not being thankful. There is a correlation between faith and thankfulness. Now, with this, maybe we could give a little bit of history of where we're at today. Because without a doubt, we're living in a country that is unthankful. How did we get there? Well, it started right after World War II. And World War II, all the way up to that time, to be an American, you struggled. You worked hard. You did not have a lot. There was not a lot of luxuries. You worked hard to supply for your family. You worked hard to supply to get the house. You worked hard just to work hard to get everything in life. And so a mentality came up right after World War II, after seeing the horrors of war and seeing all the things that they struggled with. People came up with a mentality that I want my kids to have have it better than what I did. And that's not a bad thing, but we want, and we want our kids not to struggle like we did. We want our kids to have more than we did. We want them to have a better life than we did. There's that desire for it. And so they worked hard to supply for their kids to have it. Well, that next generation took that same mentality. They didn't struggle as much as those people from World War II. They still had to struggle. They still had to work. And they carry the mentality, I want my kids to have things better than I did. And so the next generation went. They didn't have it as bad as the previous generation. They had more stuff. They had vehicles. They started getting TVs. They started having all this other stuff. They started to have more of an enjoyable life. And they said, I want my kids to have it better than I have it. And so they passed it on. And then what happened about a generation to two generations ago is that that mentality then supplied something called entitled. Instead of seeing how much people worked to get what they had, people said, I deserve to have all of this. You have children that says, I deserve an Xbox. Everyone else has one. I have one. And my parents are cruel if I don't get one. Listen, I deserve, as soon as I'm 16, I deserve a car, no questions asked. And if I don't get one, I am being neglected in being things. Little kids with phones. Listen, you know, most of us growing up, we didn't even have phones. You had a landline that everyone had to share. And when the internet came, no one could use the phone. But now, I deserve a phone. And, and we have kids today. I work with police officers and cha- as a chaplain. My mom wouldn't buy me a phone. You're eight years old. You don't need a phone. Who are you going to call? My mom won't give me a phone. And I'm just throwing a fit. And of course, mom's not disciplining them. Because I want my kids to have it better off than me. And they brought, put the wrong application. And now we have an entitled I don't need to work for anything. Everyone should hand me one. I don't have to work for a house. They should just go ahead and issue me one. I don't have to work for my food. They should automatically give it to me. Doesn't that match the age that we have today? That's because that's what they were taught. They were taught that you should have things better than I have it. That you shouldn't have to work for it. Here, just take it as a platter. Take it as a gift. And the people think they deserve it because they didn't have to work for it. Now we have plenty. We have five TVs in every room in the house. We have everyone has their own computer. Everyone has their own phone. And it's just expected. Kids today expect, I'm entitled to this. This is what everyone else has. Why wouldn't I have it? And this entitled thing The bottom line of the entitlement is because I deserve it, because this is what I get. I'm no longer thankful for it because I deserve it. You understand faith and thankfulness go hand in hand. That I should be thankful because I don't deserve it and someone gave it to me anyways. 
My parents worked hard to give me this thing. I am thankful for the work that they put into this. I'm thankful that they sacrificed to allow me to have this gift. They sacrificed to get me to college. They sacrificed to whatever else. I am thankful that they provided it for me. Not that I deserved it. You understand there is an idea of faith. So what happens is that when we start thinking that I deserve something, we're no longer thankful. So therefore, the very first step of getting away from God is the simple thing of unthankfulness. Do you know that what we do deserve? Hell. Anything above hell is a blessing of God. And we have so much. We are blessed people among above measure. And yet, Taco Bell didn't get my drink right. And I'm just going to be mad at them for the rest of the day. We throw little tiny fits and we're not thankful for it. We're so entitled that if they don't make my latte right with a certain amount of foam and the skim milk made out of uh, cats or whatever they, they get the milk from. I mean... If they don't, they throw entire fits if one ingredient is off by a small measure, right? We see that. Now, it's easy to point to everyone else, but think about all the things we're not thankful for. We take it for granted. We put a big highlight this last week on Bibles. You know, we should be thankful for a Bible. Remember, thankfulness and faith go together. If we realize that most of the world doesn't have a Bible in their own language, and we do, if I'm going to be thankful for it, then I'm going to appreciate it and read it and spend time with it. Does it make sense? Faithfulness and thankfulness go together. Faith and thankfulness. But when we start going, ah, great, God gave me a Bible. I deserve a Bible. Well, then you're not going to read it. And you're going to step away. Doesn't that make sense? If you realized how precious your Bible was, you would read it more. And be thankful. When's the last time you were thankful for God? I'm thankful for God's word. I love it so much. That's the way we should be. But ah, I don't care about it. Just, you know, get in after church, toss it in the back of your car and not see it until the next time you go to church. You know, we get to the place where we take our health for granted. And we're not thankful for the health and life and strength God gave to us. We don't deserve health. And if we realize that God gave us this health, we should be thankful. And then by faith, realize that God has given to me for a reason. And I need to use it wisely. You understand thankfulness and faith work together, hand in hand. We could go on and give illustration after illustration. But we understand that we may look at the rest of the world and say they're spoiled brats. But if we're going to be realistic, we're spoiled brats beyond measure too. My chili's too hot. My chili's too cold. My chili's just right. We complain about everything. My bed doesn't heat up and move fast enough. You know, our, grand, our grandparents didn't have comfortable beds. Amen. They had lumps. You know, you understand, we're spoiled beyond measure and then we complain about what we have. All the time because we're unthankful, entitled people. That's our generation that we're into. And we wonder why we're not so close to the Lord because we're too busy complaining and not being thankful for what we have and taking it for granted and not realizing how blessed we truly are. That God has done so much for us. So what happened? So my first step of stepping away from God is unthankfulness. All right. So I step away from God. Where does that lead? Does it, oh, well, I'm just not close to God. No, no, no. Let's see what God warns us of. Verse 21 again. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. That word vain means empty. That means the way that we think is starting to become empty and bloated because we're not thankful. That's what we were just saying. We're now entitled. Now, isn't that vain thoughts, empty thoughts to think that we deserve stuff? It is. But our thinking is now changed because we're not thankful. We take it for granted. And their foolish heart was darkened. Meaning that instead of having the light of the Bible and the light of God, it now becomes darkened because it's now selfish. Verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. 
Listen, how great I am. I deserve my macaroni and cheese only with freshly sliced cheese put upon it, boiled together. The only way I take my hot chocolate is if you take chocolate and you melt it by hand. We become foolish. We profess ourselves to be wise. I deserve my double latte with special skim milk that only comes from eagle's nest roasted over certain... And we become foolish. <laughs> and we think that we're so wise and look at my grand latte thing that you need to have only found at scooters, not Starbucks. And, and we become fools. And it all becomes we're unthankful. Verse 33, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made of a corruptible man to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. God points out something that because we're unthankful, what happens is that we start looking at ourselves more than God. We start to think about how we need to worship ourselves I need that triple latte with extra espresso just to stay alive because I deserve it every day. And <laughs> we worship ourselves with our stuff. I deserve the 72 inch plasma TV that's smart and obeys my commands. And we worship ourselves with stuff because we deserve it. And we're unthankful. And we waste our money on stuff. And don't use it for the Lord. And we waste our time on ourselves. And not give it to the Lord. Because we were not thankful. The unthankfulness now comes to where we're looking at ourselves. We're entitled and we're spoiled. And we deserve this. And God is no longer in our thoughts and we become more and more foolish and we worship us more than God. Notice as it goes on. Verse number 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now we know that there's many applications but in this one what happens God says fine. You think you're entitled? Go ahead. Help yourself. And what happens is we dishonor ourselves when God allows us to have the lust of our hearts. I want that new TV. Do you understand the new 130 inch TV came out and I just have to have it. What would you do with such a thing? I need that IMAX theater in the back of my house. Three stories a picture so I can watch a football game. You understand that becomes foolish. But you know someone out there. That's their dream. I deserve that. And what happens is we dishonor ourselves. By the lust of our own hearts. That triple latte. And if it's not done right. I'm going to throw it on the floor. And they're going to have to clean it up. And they're going to have to give me a new one. And I'm going to care in this thing. Until they get it for free. When the manager is just tired of dealing with me. When's the last time you had a fit? Don't raise your hand. But think about this. We've thrown fits. It may not be that latte thing. But because the waitress didn't do something right. Or the, the person at the, the register was too slow. Or they looked at you kind of crooked. Or, and we throw a little fit. And we dishonor ourselves. And then give them a track and say we want you to come to our church. What? Is everyone at the church like that? Sure. Why not? No, we dishonor ourselves by our foolish actions because we're entitled, spoiled brats. There is nothing like watching a 24-year-old in the middle of a store yelling at his mom, but I want that game, I deserve that game. Get a job. But he's, it's a true story, it's happened. Throwing a fit because a 24-year-old is told no by his mom that he can't get another video game in Walmart. And everyone's looking. I mean, it's barely passable when a three-year-old's doing it. Where does that come from? Entitled, spoiled, and unthankful. And they become foolish. 
Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forevermore. Where did this all come from? On thankfulness. No wonder the Bible gives commandments about thankfulness. Several times in the Bible it says to be thankful for all things for this is the will of God for you. The Bible says in all things give thanks. That's an, a verse. The Bible gives several commandments about being thankful. And it seems to be an easy command but we're not thankful. The Bible, or the, there's a song in our songbook that says, count your many blessings, name them one by one. You understand, if you actually got a piece of paper and started counting your blessings, you'd be very surprised about what God has done. Amen. We're spoiled. Entitled. And this spoiled entitledness has made us selfish, made us foolish. We worship us more than God. We get to the place that I'll only serve God as long as it's convenient to me. Hey, the football game's on. Don't even ask to go to church. That's just, that's unreasonable. Right? My favorite thing's on TV. I can't go. And we worship the creature more than the creator. And we only serve God when it's convenient because we're worshiping us and we'll give God whatever time, you know. I could schedule it. And I, you know what? I could sacrifice one hour here. Here you go, God. Take that. You know how foolish that really is? And it's because we're unthankful. If you learn to be thankful, then you notice that your faith in God goes up because look at what God has done for me. He has done so much more. You'll learn to appreciate things more. I'm sorry you got a double latte instead of a triple latte, but praise the Lord that I still have it. You could be thankful for that thing that wasn't quite what you expected. I'm sorry, you didn't give me the right brand of dark chocolate. Now I'm just going just, to, just can't do it. You know, we laugh at it because it's foolishness. Yeah. Until we do it. Yeah. And then we do it, it's the end of the world. And it all comes from not being thankful. And by the way, as we saw in the story in Luke, being thankful is a rare thing. Only one out of ten they were healed. A miracle had been done. And only one out of ten had decided they, they were going to go back and thank the Lord. You think that thankfulness is a problem? Absolutely. It is hard for to be thankful. It's hard for us to be thankful. I want you to think about all the things that God has done for us. Has God saved you from hell? Maybe perhaps you've never personally accepted that gift. You understand, Jesus died on the cross for you. He died on the cross to save you for your sins. And he gave it to you as a free gift. If we were thankful for it, we would receive that gift. If you've never done that, what would stop you from taking that gift? He paid the price, a horrible price to give you salvation. For those of you who are saved, one of the things that we have a problem with is we get used to being saved. Amen. We get to the place where we're used to being forgiven. We don't know what it's like to not live as saved people. Not, we take it for granted. Are you a thankful person? I think today, probably the best thing we could do is just fall on our face before God like the Samaritan did. And just take time to be thankful to him. And I guarantee, because there's a correlation between thankfulness and faith, that if you take time to be thankful to God, your faith in him increases a lot. What has God done for me? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time 
to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.